Hello, welcome along. This week, we've got Frank Cotterell Boyce sharing his writer's routine in a house filled with his huge family. Frank enjoys, thankfully, working in chaos with loads of noise around him. He wrote his first novel after a push from director Danny Boyle, and mainly we find out what drives his stories is the thought of hundreds of kids staring up at him a little bit bored. It's good if you've got a voice or a character for me. But it doesn't become clear. It only becomes clear to me when I'm standing up in front of about 800 kids reading a book out and I think, what should have happened in this book? (laughs) This book would be so much better if... (laughs) So stick around, it's all on the way in this week's Writer's Routine. Yes, hello. Thanks for giving us a listen and a download and a stream, however you're finding us. I really appreciate it. My name's Dan Simpson. This is Writer's Routine, the show that takes you inside the working day of an author to try and steal, I guess, some of the scheduling secrets behind their success. Now, very quickly, before we get right into it with Frank, let me just give you a slight nudge in the direction of Apple Podcasts to leave us a review. Now, if you like the show, if you find that it's helping you write, if it's giving you inspiration for your stories, well, the best way that you can say thanks for what we're doing uh, and help us out is by heading over to your favourite podcast store and subscribing. And if that place is Apple Podcasts, please make sure you leave us a review while you're on there. Now, this week, uh, we've got children's author Frank Cotterell Boyce, an absolute writing supremo, kind of. And although he's not really just a kid's author, uh, he's written screenplays and even scripted one of the most important British stories of the 21st century. Now, novel-wise, he's probably best known for Millions. Have you seen that? Uh, It's a film as well. It's the story about two lads who find a big bag full of money and they have to spend it all before the country goes to the Euro. Yes, I know how prescient. (laughs) Uh, And the money becomes kind of useless. It's strange. He wrote the screenplay, then wrote the novel, then wrote the script and turned it into a film. Uh, He wrote it and Danny Boyle directed it. He's also brought back Chitty Chitty Bang Bang for three novels and his most recent kids' books are The Astounding Broccoli Boy and Sputnik's Guide to Life on Earth. Now, on books, in this chat, we mainly focus on those two and Millions, the original. You see, I've had emails recently uh, from some of you who want to hear more screenwriting and screenplay advice. And Frank is perfect to give that. Uh, Not just writing for millions, he's written the script for loads of films throughout his time, for Michael Winterbottom, including 24-Hour Party People, A Cock and Bull Story. He's written for Soaps and loads more. So we'll hear from him how writing scripts for movies and telly is different for writing novels. And we'll also talk about his part in writing the opening ceremony uh, for the 2012 Olympic Games in London. Now, I warn you, it's quite a rambly one, this show. You see, Frank doesn't really have a strict writing routine, so trying to get it out of him took us down many blind alleys and garden paths. Uh, It's just a warning. It's kind of all over the place, but it's really good fun. Now, we'll also get some of your writing tips. We'll get a top one as well from a debut thriller author after we get into it with Frank Cotterell Boyce. And we start, as always, with what he sees around him in the place where he sits down to write. Where I normally sit down to write, um, we're stretching the definition of normal here, but I do have a little room at the top of my house, which uh, is a Victorian house that had a fire escape, which has been cut off, but like the top of the fire escape is still there. So it's got a kind of health and safety nightmare type balcony that you could step out onto if you were feeling brave. Um, It's got loads of books, mostly piled up on the floor. Um, It's next to the playroom which became the classroom because my kids were home educated so it's not quiet um and what have i got on the walls on the wall i've got people write on the wall in there for some reason so there's lots of things written on the wall there's like little messages to me and like slogans and things that the kids have written on the wall and there's a reproduction of bruegel's tower of babel which i love because it's 
it's, I don't know if you know that painting, but it's very, um, it's about the Tower of Babel, but it's, it's, it's obviously written, uh, painted by someone who really knew about the construction industry. So it's very specific about hods and scaffolds, and it's really great to look at. Um, so as well as the, the writing that people leave for you on the walls, <laughs> have you got any other thing that's kind of inspirational there when you're writing a story? Do you know what I have? I have got, like, when Liverpool were 3-0 down in the Champions League in Istanbul, I went out at half time to get a takeaway to cheer everybody up and of course by the time I got back it was three all and I'd missed like the greatest very quickly I don't know if anyone actually saw that because whenever I speak to a Liverpool fan they never saw it yeah exactly <laughs> no, I'm, so, yeah. I'm so annoyed by well, it I, some of them must have because I went to South Road to get this takeaway and honestly every pub was full but you could feel you could hear silence coming out of the pub it was so weird because it was packed but like no sound was coming out and uh, so I got this takeaway and went back and missed all the goals. But my son, who is now well, I've heard, well, 21 now, but he'd drawn the goals for me. He'd drawn a picture of each goal. And I've got that on the wall because the more I think about it, the more that's what art is about. It's about sort of rescuing something from time and especially something good and something that you've missed. So, um, and it, you know, drawing your attention to something that you might miss is noticing things, isn't it? So he do that, and I, I love the love in it, but I also love the kind of the mission of it. So that's that's right in front of me, and it always cheers me up. How about when you're writing? Might we see some plot specific things? Maybe a little bit of planning adorning the walls. If only. No, it's so chaotic. You've no idea how chaotic it is. That whole everything about me is chaotic, and. It's just completely ironic that I don't want a programme called Writer's Routine. Well, I'm excited for this now. <laughs> Let's unpack the chaos, shall yeah, we? Yeah. As you've uh, alluded to, the show is Writer's Routine. Talk me through yours as best as you can. So <laughs> the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, yeah. on, a, on a normal day when normal you are day. sat down to write, as best as you can, how does it work? Leave no kind of boring stone unturned. I assure you it's useful. OK, uh, well, I always make a cup of tea for everybody. I make the kids sandwiches for their school. I go to the gym for like half an hour or so and run, run to it, run back, go to the gym. Which is a terrible mistake because I come back feeling quite blissed out and just sort of sit there going, looking at the white piece of paper going, oh, it's lovely. <laughs> um, I'm a Catholic. A couple of days a week, I probably go to Mass. Friday, I go to Mass. Um, so I'm not really sitting down till about 10 o'clock, which is a terrible mistake. I know that's a mistake. Because the mornings are the only bit that count. I know that in the afternoon you just doze off. Um, well, and then, then write for the morning, uh, pretend to write for the afternoon, and then it's pointless once the kids are home. So you've got a very narrow window there. They're really narrow. How much do you tend to get done in, in the, say, the two, three hours that you're sat down it's for? It's really weird. I, I think my problem is that I am quite reactive. And I think that comes from years in the film industry where people are literally bawling at you down the phone quite a lot of the time and you have to turn around things around very quickly or there'd then be like a 10-year pause where nobody's interested at all. So I've got no discipline about just keeping my own ship sailing. I kind of wait till everything's gone mad and then, then I, can work, I can work really fast and really hard if I ever need to, which is a terrible thing to know. I mean, it's just an awful thing to know. Like, I think Millions, which has stood the test of time, so I know it's good, because like, I did an event about Millions today, so it's like 15 years old, that book. I know that I wrote the last 6,000 words in a day for that. I just, and it wasn't all I did that day. <laughs> <laughs> but knowing that that's feasible is just terrible. Well, I guess, as well as knowing that you can work very quickly under pressure if needs yeah. be, what else do you know about how best you write that I'm potential I have the potential to waste enormous amounts of time and doodle and just not get it right and not concentrate properly what about the this reverse turn into confession it is Ash Wednesday so <laughs> that's okay what about the reverse of that though um, as I said you, you published you know a fair few books now you've written many screenplays have you learned any tricks along the way that help you get the words down on paper? Perhaps a certain like hymn or classical music that you'd like on in the background? No. <laughs> I mean, you only do it in the morning. Make sure that your social media is disconnected. It's simple, isn't it? Just disconnect the social media and sit down and just bloody work. And just don't and don't move till you've done something. You know, that's the thing. I think you kind of get up thinking. 
right, well, I'll, this isn't really happening, but I'll go down and, you know, put a wash on, or something <laughs> like that, or make soup. Don't do that. Get something done. That's what I've learned. And your fingers to keyboard, man? I, um, yeah, pretty much, because... I'm big on rewriting I love rewriting and uh, I hate writing and I love rewriting that's if, if I could get a job like polishing other people's books I'd be so happy you know um, yes yeah, so you kind of know it's going to change a lot wait uh, well, so let's unpack that very quickly you see you, why do you love rewriting what, why is that that's when it starts to come good isn't it and it's like well it's, there's nothing more miserable than writing I mean anyone who tells you that they love writing is just lying to you because it's just blank pages then you've got to fill them in and it's terrible it's just, so if you're tidying you know, it's up happen and it's like oh I don't know what's going to happen and you can spend ages thinking about it. so if you are tidying up when you're rewriting when you're doing your edits um, and you enjoy that so much what state is your first draft in if, if, so if, if I were to pick it up I never get to the end of a first draft I have uh, someone here at Macmillan called Sarah Dudman who doesn't even work for Macmillan anymore but I send her everything and she'll go that's just rubbish and it's, it's really gone horribly wrong or whatever and then and you need to start again and I'll do that and, that, and I kind of edge my way through a first draft uh, and I'll start rewriting long before I get to the end I, uh, the first draft will be like three quarters of the book because I want that ending to be you know fresh and exciting and I want to know where it's going and you keep your options open I think that's the thing it's a very old idea really two little boys find a bag of money and it never really took flight for, until something quite uh, well two things one oh yeah that, that's okay so so it's kind of playing around with that as a screenplay and then this this is a bit sad but one of my friends uh, had cancer and was dying and the house was full of people talking about going to a better place and angels and blah 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 and the you know the Macmillan nurses are saints and stuff and I thought well if you're a kid and you're listening to that would you take it literally and that that's when I started looking at the saints aspect of it and thinking that was like finding a bag of money because thinking well everybody knows these names and nobody remembers these stories and these incredible stories that you could just throw in there you know about you know St. Simon Stylites living on top of a pillar or St. Lawrence being roasted on a spit and all these like amazing things you know um, and that just felt like riches and I thought and it was riches at my fingertips because I did know them but was really aware that other people didn't so it's like I think it's that thing of like you've got the gem of an idea and it's not going to grow until something another idea fertilises it so it was kind of floating around there and then this other thing came in and then and then Danny said you need a ticking clock and I thought and I'd just come back from Germany just joined the Euro and I thought yeah, that's not going to be like that if we do it here. It's funny, I wrote, that, and one of the reasons I wrote Millions so quickly is that I thought we'd join the Euro and I thought <laughs> I'd be cashing in on this big thing. You, know? you need another one now, I feel. Yeah, I'd written the first Brexit novel. <laughs> um, so I guess it might be tough to do with Millions then, let, let, just, just because you wrote that at, at such rapid pace. I, I'm, I just really want to unpack the process, which I understand, which I, I, I figured For out. For a book? Yeah, so... so I guess let's do it with your most recent children's novel, which is Sputnik's Guide to Life on Earth. Oh, yeah. But that's, really, that's a really happy story, though, because I was driving along the Formby Bypass and that idea just leapt into the car. So, so what did it take? What was the elevator pitch that that idea leapt out at you as? Oh, really simple. I mean, I literally turned around to my daughter at that moment and said, an alien comes to Earth, this kid can see that it's an alien, everyone else thinks it's a dog. Boom. There you go. And she went, yeah, it's all right. So then what did you do? We're talking went, planning and plotting, and yeah, what happens no, next? No, just started started writing. Just, I never plan. I never plan, and I don't. I know that lots of writers have a very clear idea of how a book is going to end, and I never ever have had that. And I, like maybe an image, but not an ending. So for this one, Runaway Robots, that started with I met a kid, who I met a kid through this charity thing, and he had been truanting from school a lot, and hanging around in airports, and. He always hung around in arrivals because people hang out in arrivals. In departures, people are busy, but in arrivals, people are waiting. So you're not very conspicuous if you're waiting. I thought, that is fantastic. So I kind of knew it had to end with somebody coming through arrivals for him. But I didn't know that was going to be a, a robot. <laughs> <laughs> so you might not know your ending, um, but quite often on the show, an author will describe their work to me as almost like a road map. So they know the start, so they know the end, you don't know the end, but um, 
and the, and then they talk about when things become clear to them through the mit through the front window as they're driving. Yeah. How does it work with you when you before you start uh, writing that horrible first draft that you really hate? Yeah. How much do you know about the story for Sputnik? Nothing. Like a voice, maybe. Like like it's good if you've got a voice or a character for me, but it doesn't become clear. It only becomes clear to me when I'm standing up in front of about eight hundred kids reading a book out, and I think. <laughs> What should have happened in this book? <laughs> it, this book would be so much better if. You know, um, this is no, no. I don't have that. Clear. The clarity moment is when the re- rewriting, and with, especially with Sarah Dubman, who's my editor, who's who will really push me to to get it tight. You know, and get it tight. I'm not. I just I just find that quite hard to believe in in, in only the way that. You know, b- before you are rewriting, there are words on the page. Where, where, when are you figuring I out what comes I often don't even remember doing it? them, though. You know, you come to them and think, what's that? And that's terrible. Or that's really good or whatever. And I've got no memory of writing them. And you just asked me about Sputnik. I have literally no memory of writing that book. None at all. I'm so useless for this podcast, you know. No, that's okay. That's fine. Um, so with Sputnik, right? You yeah. turn to your daughter. Yeah. It's, I've got this brilliant idea. Yeah. There's an alien. Yeah. No one knows he's an alien. Everyone thinks he's a dog apart from one lad. Yeah. Um, is that it? Then, then you just then you just started <laughs> typing. I kind of like. Well, because I've done a lot, you know, I've been around a long time, so I, I do have instincts. Do, do you know what I mean? I kind of when I'm talking to film students, I always say to them, "Don't worry about all that kind of um, screen school stuff about plot and arc and stuff. You know that you've been watching movies since you were a kid." You know, you know what makes a film work. Just reflect upon what you know, you know, and, and, and ask, keep asking yourself those questions. Is this, is this really big emotional enough or whatever? But that, that, that kind of diagnostic set, you probably don't need. Like, I think if you can tell a joke, you know how important it is that everything is in the right place. If you tell a joke out of order, it's not going to work. So what are your instincts then? What are your instincts for writing? If you really I, did think I about think it. I think they're all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I've got terrible instincts. I just can't make it work professionally. I kind of get into a book and think, this isn't working. So I go up and start again. And I think that's wrong. That's not what you should do. You should just keep head buzzing your way through to the end and then make it good. And what I tend to do is I lose faith about a third of the way through and I'll just start again, which I've always think is like, oh, that's, yeah, that's because I've got standards. It isn't because you've got standards. It's because you've got a lack of courage. And you should just keep going to the end because... Where the, the time that ideas come is when you're actually writing if you kind of go off on a walk and plan things it's like, that's not when ideas come ideas come when you're really under pressure and the characters are kind of and you're in a bit of a zone you need to get yourself in a zone I think you know you need to work on a book every day because then you never leave it alone even if you don't do very much in a day but if you're doing it every day then it's, it's going to come back to you because I think the, th- the books that you really like reading fe- always feel as though they've been written in a breath, you know, because it, what, it's so beautiful in a book when something comes back from the beginning and it's replayed or if, whether that's a gag or a poetic image or whatever. So you've got to kind of know that everything's in it. If you spend years writing a book, this is what I do, then you've forgotten all those things. <laughs> Often I can look at things and think, in a, like in a movie, you would... Like a plot point should not be enough. You need to kind of, um, I don't know how to put this, but like you can't go A, B, C. It's always got to be a chord. It's got to be A, one, and a colour. And so it's got to be emotionally right. It's got to have the action's got to be doing a lot of the work. It should have something attractive about it, like whether it's a great turn of phrase or a good shot or whatever. And it's got to advance the plot. I think quite often I read books where the plot is advanced and then someone will stop and do a gag. Or they'll stop and do a description. It's like, no, that description needs to be moving the story on. And that gag needs to be moving the story on. And those things need to be all happening at the same time. It needs to be denser, you know. I often read, especially children's books, they seem quite thin. On, like spread thin, you know. And they could be tighter and richer. Well, let's talk about children's books then. As a children's writer, when I read your work, and, and I do a lot of work in children's writing... Um, I'm always confused about... I'm well, not confused. I always am fascinated by an author being able to, you know, speak to an eight, a nine, a ten-year-old. How do you find the voice without patronising, without pandering? 
Well, partly I've got seven kids, so there's that, and I now have grandchildren as well. So I'm around children a lot. I mean, I'm not, I'm not taking any credit for that. I'm just like physically around children a lot more than a lot of grown-ups. Um, but also, if you're a children's writer, you are going to end up standing in front of a bunch of kids reading this out. And that's always in my mind. I know lots of writers say, oh, I write for me, or I write for The Voice, or blah, blah, which is lovely, and I'm really happy for them. But like, if you're... Like, I'm acutely aware that I'm going to be standing in front of 100 kids. If this book is working, it's going to take me to stand in front of 100 kids, 98 of whom don't want to be there. And you've got to win them over. So it's that kind of attention thing. Is, is, that's very real to me. That I, I look at a page and think, would I want to read this out in front of um, some kids who don't want to be there? And using that then, yeah. what do you know is going to make them pay attention to you? Abs- clarity, definitely. You've really got to know what's happening all the time. Um, a good gag, but that doesn't mean like a funny line. I think a good gag is like when you, a good gag is when you've taken it to its limit, you know. So quite often, what Sarah said to me is like, "That's funny, but you've kind of left it, you know. You can't push it further, push it further, push it further, push it further." So like, I've just been in a theatre and read out a scene in Cosmic where he passes himself off as a teacher. And it's like, I can remember setting that up and it being quite amusing. But like, she was like, well, like, that's in a classroom. It's much better if it's in front of the whole school. It's much better if having been passed himself off as a teacher, he asks the kid to do something that shouldn't be done, you know. And they, so he, he asks them all to leave school. And so it's like, just push it further and push it further and push it further. So the deal is, every week I'm trying to fill the show with all sorts of writing advice. You know, tips from our main author who we chat to for like half an hour. We also, as you know, get something from a bonus writer, uh, a a friend of the show, a guest that we've had on in the last few weeks, makes a little bonus appearance. And I also want loads of your tips on here as well. So if you've got something that helps your day, that sparks ideas for your stories, that helps you work the best, I want to hear it. You can tell me exactly what it is over at writersroutine.com. Then I'll share it for everyone else on the show. Uh, This is from, let's see who we got. Oh, Louisa up in Edinburgh. Hey, Louisa. Uh, By the way, if you're up in Edinburgh and if you run into Ian Rankin, I don't know, maybe the Oxford Bar or something, say hi from me. He's a friend of the show. And also ask him if he could give the episode that we did together a little retweet. That would be greatly appreciated. Uh, Now, Louisa, her tip is she sets herself time limits. She says that she sits down to write for 90 minutes. And if nothing's happening, then that's it. She stops. She does other things. It's not going to happen that day. Kind of interesting, that one, Louisa, because I've spoken to many authors who think the secret is just to sit down and plough on, to push through the block. But if you're saying that you find that that's useless, that you're not going to get any good words down anyway, if you can't write that day, then I'm not going to argue with it. Thanks for the tip. If it works for you, it works for you. Uh, Right, let's head over to Thomas. Hello, Thomas, in New York City, NYC. I love it, you know, as a show. I'll be honest, we don't have the, you know, the biggest audience of any podcast out there. We're not My Dad Wrote a Porno. But I love the fact that we have such a a dedicated and enthusiastic team of writers all over the world that listen and contribute. I really do like that. Uh, Thomas has two words for us. Double espresso. He says, if that much caffeine can't get your story out, then nothing will. Uh, And lastly, hello to Matt up in Yorkshire in the UK. His tip is music, but proper music, he says, with no words. He says they're a distraction. Uh, His current playlist is big brass band stuff. He's got the Stranger Things soundtrack on there as well. And Peter and the Wolf. I completely get the music thing, you know. I really love the fact that what you're listening to in the background can influence and reflect the words that you're writing on the page and i get that you know with peter and the wolf maybe you're right you're getting a chase scene down or stranger things it's something dark and foreboding and mysterious i'll be honest though i've got no clue what big brass band music can help you write i mean what's happening with your story there matt Anyway, thank you so much for getting involved, for sending your tip over to me. If you've got some writing advice that you want to share with us, send it over to me on Twitter. Uh, You can search and follow at WritersPod on there. You can DM Writers Routine on Instagram and you can click the contact page through our website. Hello, my name's Harriet Tice. Uh, My novel Blood Orange is now available and my writing tip would be don't be afraid to scrap your pet project and start again if you 
get to the point that you feel you can't do anything more with it because I think it's in the process of starting again that you can sometimes discover your best work. If you want more tips from Harriet Tice and you want to hear loads more about her debut novel Blood Orange, you can get them all. Uh, Catch up with a full episode right now and send me your tip over at writersroutine.com. Right, let's get back into it then with Frank Cotterell Boyce, a writer who has pretty much woven himself into British culture and identity. Perhaps writing the opening to the 2012 Olympic ceremony in London kind of helped with that. You can hear more about that in this second half of the chat. Now, Frank has won the prestigious Carnegie Medal for Millions back in 2004, uh, published loads more children's books along the way. He's picked up the Guardian Children's Fiction Prize, the Roald Dahl Funny Prize, to name but a few. Now, in this part, not only do we hear about the role that he played in writing the Olympic opening ceremony, we also chat about screenwriting and about the novel that started it all, Millions. You see, originally, we touched on this earlier, uh, but it was a screenplay that he was pitching, and Danny Boyle read it and said, well, the first 30 pages are brilliant. I think it needs to be a, a novel first. I think you should go away and write a kid's book, and then we can turn it into a film. And that's what it did. So I want to talk to him about that, about that process, changing a book to a film, back to a book, and also what it's like writing children's novels. You know, telling stories, pitching an idea at an audience that's probably much younger than yourself, that's liable to get bored very, very easy. Uh, For Frank, how did he find it? How did he speak to them? The film was one thing and the book was another. And I did actively want to write children's books. And I know what you're saying about the difference between adult and children's fiction. For me, that difference is that um, children's fiction is often a lot more ambitious. And like this sounds ridiculous, but more intellectually challenging as well, because it's always about ideas and it's always about big ideas. Whereas adult fiction is often has a surface toughness or a surface darkness but underneath is actually quite slight. Um, that, and not, that's not to disparage anybody, but adults get concerned with things that come and go, like Brexit or whatever. Like, I mean, I'm sure Brexit will have huge consequences and blah, 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 but it is just a thing. Kids are concerned about things like death, you know, <laughs> life, hunger. Um, well, you know, that, that, I think that thing the other week where young people went on strike from school to protest about climate change while adults were mired down in identity politics around what is essentially a trade treaty, you know, which, like, once it's done, it will be done. Like, so kid, the young kids were concerned with this matter of our survival as a species, and our executive was bogged down in scoring points off each other. It's like, that's, I think that's children's fiction. Does, so do that, does that idea influence all of your kids' books then. So when you're writing, you know, Sputnik about an alien, is, is that really about something, a much higher concept? Yeah, it's about dementia, and about, and, and, but not about dementia as a, as a disease, but also about that, what it raises questions about memory and who we are and are we just what we remember or is there more to us than that? You know, they're kind of big themes. Um, and I'm not saying that's, that no adult writer does that. I'm just saying children's writing seems to really flexible medium for thinking about big 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 issues and it oh like to me that was always the thing you knew when you were reading narnia that it wasn't about talking animals you know whatever whatever it however it impacted on you you knew it was asking you big questions about time as well you know and the nature of time that's tom's midnight garden and all that stuff you know one of the things about being an author very simply that i think people don't think about as much as they perhaps should is the the actual words on the page yeah. So when you're being a kids writer, and I know you said earlier yeah. that, that the really important thing is is, is clarity and conciseness yeah. and making it stripped back as it yeah. needs to be. How much thought are you giving to the next word that you're writing? Is it the best word yeah, that can get this I point do, across? I do. I do think that. Yeah, and I do work that over. And I, I do try to keep it really simple. Keeping it really simple is not the same as keeping it very plain. You know, because like it may well be that the only word to describe somebody is tatterdemalion. You know, <laughs> that might be the right word. But yeah, I am really conscious of not of of making sure that I choose words that have that are really clear about what they're saying, I, and or are playful. You know, that, that that images that or words that you throw in that make a kid laugh. I'm very aware that like uh, the right 
a, a surprising word in the right sentence will make you laugh. It doesn't have to be a gag. It just has to be like the the right word in a. And how much does your an unexpected word? You know. Yeah, of course, of course. And and how much does your as I say, I've got a lot of people who want to hear more about screenwriting. Uh, how much does your your writing day or process change when you're writing a, a, a script? Because surely that's a lot... There are a lot more plot points that you have... It's, it's a lot more formatted by definition. There are a lot more plot yeah. points that you need to yeah. hear. How does that work? When you've got an idea in your head for a script, how does that get down onto the page? Um, I understand that's a huge question to answer. Well, it's such a different process because you will have taught a lot about... I mean, first of all, like nearly all the screenplays I've written have been based on true stories. There's hardly anything that I've just made up. Um, so you've got that safety net. Then you've got the safety net of the formula. You know, that everyone, everyone knows what the formula is. And if you're going to diverse, ver, diverge from it, you're doing it deliberately. You're not just like flailing around like when you're writing a book you often just flailing around for something that'll work with when you write a screenplay you kind of know you know that's the beginning that's the middle that's the end this is that three something's got to stop something's got to happen there something's got to happen here and you can you kind of you kind of filling in um it's like a washing line and you kind of filling in you know what goes there what goes there what goes there um which that's not the case with the book. So there's that. And, oh, but most of all, you'll have taught a lot about it and quite often you'll have done a verbal pitch which can be quite precise. So like I'm doing the film with Sputnik at the moment. Now I can do you a verbal pitch of Sputnik's Guide to Life. It's 40 minutes long. There's really not much more to add but, but before you start writing the screenplay. Do you know what I mean? Like no one wants you to write that screenplay till they know what's in it. That's the other thing. It's like publishers are quite pleased to be surprised and astonished. You mentioned earlier on when talking about books that one of the things you think some authors possibly get wrong is that, you know, they'll have point A, plot B, point C without really any interlinking and, yeah. you know, it's very matter of fact. Yeah. Is that the same in script writing? Surely you almost have to take point A, point B, point C at face value when you're writing a script. Yeah, but I think they've all got to happen at the same time in a, in a screenplay, so... Like, if, if there's an action sequence, something has to be happening to between those characters in that action sequence. It can't just be some action and then we talk about it. It's got to be happening and you've got to kind of know what everyone's thinking all the time. And, uh, and I do think that's something I admire about a great screenplay is that it's, it's always firing on all cylinders, a really good screenplay. I can remember that process so clearly uh, because I wrote it all up <laughs> um, for people to remember it by as we were going along. Um, da- Danny came in and he'd watched China and we knew that we, ha- we couldn't go that way we had to do something very different um, you know because we would never have those resources what year would this have been in? Uh, in late 2009 and um, and he, he just had a, he always got a word and his word was visceral it's got to be visceral and that the first thing on that washing line was you need to show the rings See, maybe that's a really good model for telling a story, you know. You need to show the emblem early up, and it's like, and it's got, you need a striking image of the, the rings. And I think both, both of us, because of our background, immediately started thinking about work, and he, we had ideas about digging them up out of the ground or whatever, and then Danny came up with, like, smelting them, you know, and physically sm- smelting these things, and had these great images from films about work, and rivers of metal and Joseph Wright of Derby went on the blackboard and all and on the notice board and all that are you sitting around with him at a table much yeah, like this yeah, so, yeah it wasn't as fancy a room as this but it was a room and there was me Mark Tinsley who's the designer who's a genius um, Sutterat Lalab who was the costume person and then uh, and Rick came a bit later who did the music and there were other people in the room then, like, so Mark had people helping him make models and things like that. So they would all get involved in the conversation. And I would come in to kind of keep track of where the conversation was and often just writing up what we talked about in a day would, would be transformative in itself. So Danny said to you, it needs to be visceral. Yeah. Were you given this of, big idea about what, I don't know, by people up high about no, what no, it needed no, to be? No, I think they'd had their fingers burnt with the Millennium Dome and they thought, get... Uh, an author in it. it can be an authored piece and then if it stinks it can be Danny Boyle's up and celebrate I'm not being cynical I just think that was the lesson that they'd learned um, 
So he said visceral, and that ended up being smelting. And then off the back of that thought and got that conversation, I bought this book in Pandemonium, Humphrey Jennings, and that section ended up being called Pandemonium. The Humphrey Jennings thing is about the Industrial Revolution. And then we discovered this amazing thing, which is that, you know, everyone we were talking to about that opening ceremony was assuming, you know, a history of Britain, and their vision of the history of Britain was Tudors and Churchill. That was it. And it, like, nationally, they'd forgotten that we did the Industrial Revolution. And the stuff that our families have been involved in, you know, were digging things up with that ground, building things, making things. That, would, that had been forgotten in history. So it was exciting to be talking about chimneys and hammers and, and, and Brunel and engineering and stuff like that. What form did it take? So uh, what I saw on my telly in front of me, you know, you had thousands of actors and dancers doing it. What were they given? Like, what was Danny given to direct with? Was it a, was it a script? Was it a novel? What was it? There were pages that would make sure everyone knew what the overall thing was. I've still got those, and they're lovely. I'm really proud of those. Um, and they were, like, concise descriptions of what the overall point of it was. And then it, you would break it, but Danny would break it down into elements. And, I mean, it was simpler than you think. And, like, having a kind of a, a narrative arc... So there'd be like a, a thing that said, we're doing this to celebrate this and it's going to be this and it's going to, and the feelings that we want to evoke are this and it comes from this and they would have like pictures on it, kind of like a mood board thing and then it would be like an, a chronology of what would happen over that section. And then choreographer would work on this bit, Mark would work on this bit, Pyro would work on that bit and then it would all come together. I guess physically, so we, I don't know the answer to this might just be it was the mood board, but as the writer... This is going to sound quite an aggressive question. I don't mean it to. What did you physically write? Um, anything that needed to be written. So there were those... I think those documents were... Kind of, well, first of all, I wrote up the conversations that people were having. And writing them up was transformative. And then I wrote these documents that you would give to, like, a choreographer or a designer or someone who would come on to say what, what this was about. Um, as a writer, I was bringing a lot in like poetry and stuff like that for people to read to create a kind of ambience but then ultimately anything that needs writing ultimately I wrote the media guide the minute by minute media guide which was like a fantastic thing I think what was interesting was that people were using skills that they'd never used before in their lives and then suddenly went back to their core skills because I remember Sutterat sitting literally so you know she's this top designer uh, she teaches at Harvard now and uh, I remember sitting there with a needle and thread and I ended up writing letters, the media guide, I wrote the brochure, stuff like, you know, crazy typing stuff, you know. And that is it for this week's Writer's Routine. You can get loads more about Frank's work over at writersroutine.com. Now, if you enjoyed the show, I'd love for you to subscribe to us on your favourite podcast place. If that podcast place is Apple, uh, make sure you leave us a review while you're there. It really helps out with the chart. Uh, and it can let people who need the advice from our authors get the advice from our authors. Also, make sure you give us a follow on Twitter, at WritersPod there, or on Instagram as well, Writers Routine. You can find out everything that you need at writersroutine.com too. Now, next week, we're chatting to the Booker Prize nominee, the novelist and the poet, Adam Folds, all about his new book. I'll see you then. Bye.